Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Folks, for the end of every year, I enjoy putting together a top 10 list of the year. I find it a huge challenge, but it's something that I enjoy doing and I have no reason not to do it this year. Uh, 2022 has featured a lot of interesting things in comics. Uh, manga and digital comics have definitely exploded. DC and Marvel have absolutely hung in there with some interesting events, mostly centered around their biggest characters like Spider-Man and Batman. A lot of stuff with Batman this year. Wow, there have been a lot of Batman titles. But uh, what's been interesting is also seeing the growth from a lot of smaller publishers in 2022, as well as a lot of genres that have sort of been neglected in the last several years, like crime and sci-fi and horror, all, all showing growth. So, so that's been interesting. It has been a huge challenge to narrow down to just 10 my list this year. So I'm going to give you my top 10 list. I'm also going to show some runner-ups and close out with just some recommendations of excellent comics because that's what I want this to be is really just a recommendation for some comics to check out that maybe you haven't. Um, but the nice thing about this is we're about to start with a top 10 list. It's my top 10 list, but what's nice is it's definitive and no one will have any arguments with my list. Okay, anyway, moving on, let's start with number 10. Number 10, Fantastic Four Full Circle. Alex Ross is a superstar artist loved for his painted covers and less common interior painted work on books like Kingdom Come and Marvels, but with Fantastic Four Full Circle, Ross has set aside the gouache to work in colored pencil. It still looks like his work, but I found it more organic and easier to connect with the characters than the somewhat more stiff painted work. He's writing here as well, remaking a classic Fantastic Four story by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, where the Explorer family members visit the Negative Zone to stop a threat to Earth and encounter something much more personal. A great standalone story that shows how the Fantastic Four works best. It's an oversized book. The colors are really, really vibrant and dynamic. I can't say enough good things about this book. And what's nice is that you can get a full story in just one volume. Always a nice feature. Moving on. Number nine, TMNT The Last Ronin. Any Ninja Turtles book that can involve its creators, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, warrants attention. The duo plotted this story, which tells a story set in the not-too-distant future, where only one of the Ninja Turtles is still alive, no longer a teenager. The book features scripting by Ninja Turtles veteran Tom Waltz, flashback sequences by Eastman himself, and solid storytelling by artist brothers Esau and Isaac Escorza. The title itself is perfect, as the lone turtle is now a ronin, a wandering warrior with no master, no lord, no family. It deals with loss, but overall in a very positive way, as the grizzled fighter remembers what his late family taught him in life and gave him his mission. he just lost his way for a while. Only the final issue came out in 2022, but it's a great finale with action and emotion. Love Ninja Turtles. Love the idea of what would just one Ninja Turtle be like if he no longer had his family. Like, what would that do? I don't want to give away which Ninja Turtle it is. Obviously, that's part of the reveal of the story itself. And while we know that now, if you've been reading the story, if you haven't read it yet, I'm keeping that quiet. Uh, a collected edition is coming out. I think it is out now, excuse me. Uh, I was picking up the individual issues, so I was sort of speaking more to five. But it's a great, great Ninja Turtles story. And the nice thing is you don't really have to have read every Ninja Turtles comic or read any version. It, it, it's by the original creators. That's something special. Check it out. Number eight, Ducks, Two Years in the Oil Fields. Kate Beaton made her name with her humor comics, like Hark a Vagrant. I am a big fan. I wasn't sure, though, what to expect with Ducks, Two Years in the Oil Fields, since I knew it was an autobiography. 
While there is some humor, it's subtle, character-based stuff. Mostly frustration. Kate took a job in the oil fields for over two years after graduating college in order to pay off her student loans quickly. But it's a job where you live in remote camps and the employee ratio was 50 men to each woman. She deals with a lot of unwanted attention as well as isolation from friends and family. But instead of being judgmental, it asks tough questions about what being so far removed from society does to the average person. Kate Beaton's storytelling skills are great. She uses minimal line work. You know, she's a cartoonist. Uh, I think she's incredibly talented. And it's just, you know, funny to see her characters deal with confusion or surprise or something because she can just like slightly raise an eyebrow and it conveys so much. She's a great storyteller. She doesn't skimp on the details on things like establishing shots for the camp itself and what the refineries look like. Um, just a really personal, heartfelt story. I'm a sucker for a good biography. I think I got a lot out of this and I think you will too. Number seven, Ace Adora. I've never been disappointed by a book from Naoki Orosawa, and Ace Adora is no exception. It's the story of a fiercely independent young girl who we know will one day save Japan from a kaiju monster attack. But first, we need to get to know her. After her parents and some siblings go missing, she becomes a pilot and helps raise her younger siblings while getting recruited by the government to investigate mysterious disasters around the coast. What makes the story work is just how interesting and well-rounded Asa herself is. She's fiery but likable and tends to bring out the best in people around her. For instance, a desperate poor man initially is ready to kidnap her but ultimately becomes her guardian and father figure as well as teacher. The book jumps forward in her life every few chapters and makes everything feel pretty epic, even though it's also a very intimate portrait of her life with her friends and makeshift family. Gorgeously rendered artwork too, of course. Every character is distinct, backgrounds are intricate, action is dynamic, everything you could want out of a comic book, I just wish it came out faster. Hopefully you've had a chance to explore some of Naoki Urasawa's work, like Pluto, Monster, 20th Century Boys, something. Uh, Ace Adora is so, so good. Everything he does is just fantastic on both an art and a storytelling level. Man, I love this book. I just, oh, please, I wish it came out faster. I wish I could get more of his work because I fly through it. I bet you will too. Number six, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow. Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow finds a new angle on how to present Supergirl and make her unique from her more famous cousin. Writer Tom King and artist Bilquis Evely start the story in space, where Supergirl is celebrating turning 21 by going to a planet where her powers are lessened so that she can enjoy an adult beverage. She gets roped into a young farm girl's quest to hunt down the man who murdered her father in cold blood. It's a road story where the two journey across a galaxy through all sorts of unique towns, hunting down a dangerous man. But is Supergirl a killer? How far is she willing to go for justice? Even though the story is told from the perspective of her companion, this story shares with us who Supergirl is in a way I've never seen shown before. I blasted through the story and I wanted more, like any good story will leave you wanting. What a revelation it was for me to discover Bilquis Evely's work. It's it's intricate and detailed and, and delicate in some ways, but it's dealing with a character who is actually much more hard than you would think. Supergirl is very, very tough. Um, some of the cultures that these characters have to go through are pretty sad and depressing. Um, some of it's got an Old West vibe to it, and other parts are, you know, really uh, far-flung sci-fi ideas. It, 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 it lets you see these characters in a range of situations uh, which really test their characters and that's a really great way to get to know what's at the heart of a character. Number five, Saga. 
I was so excited for Saga to return, but I was nervous too. This space opera by writer Brian K. Vaughan and artist Fiona Staples has been exceptional. It went on a hiatus while they worked on other projects, and I wondered if it could really capture the magic again after a break. I shouldn't have worried. The story in the 2022 issues jumps forward in time to focus on Hazel, the daughter of two aliens from warring races, as she enters adolescence. Previous issues had her as a baby. By focusing so much on Hazel and her family, we get to see the actual effects of war. The family is on the run, hunted by both sides. The tough choices they have to make to stay alive and stay ahead are heartbreaking. The comedy is hilarious, as it skewers all sorts of things from the ultra-wealthy to delusional musicians to the industrial military complex. And it highlights how important melodrama can be in people's lives, from trashy novels to soap operas. People's pastimes are surprisingly important in bringing together people with very different points of view. Hazel and her mom are down and out, but you know what's nice about this is, despite how tough their situation is, this is what Hazel has grown up in, and she's a surprisingly optimistic person. I think that carries a lot of weight in uh, helping to make the story not seem too dire or depressing or anything like that, because it's got some very serious stakes, but it's surrounded by people who are overall pretty darn positive. Saga is definitely something special. Number four, Human Target. This is the only book on my list with a creator showing up a second time. Tom King is writing this miniseries with gorgeously retro art by Greg Smallwood. Smallwood makes each character look so real, and his ability to capture expression is incredible. Smallwood also uses a color palette and design sense that reminds me of late 50s, early 60s Americana. The story involves Christopher Chance investigating who poisoned him, knowing he has just 12 days to live, and falling in love with superhero Ice along the way. It's a noir detective story set within the world of superheroes, and I am here for it every step of the way. You wouldn't necessarily think that a doomed romance and detective story set within superheroes would necessarily work as well as this does. It works very well, because uh, Christopher Chance is investigating the Justice League International, specifically the team that was that sort of funny, quirky version that Kiffin, Giffen and Demetrius and them worked on in the um, 80s into the early 90s. Uh, you know, Booster Gold, Guy Gardner, uh, some pretty goofy heroes, but it's a very serious story at its heart because we know that the main character is poisoned, is going to die. I don't know how he's going to make it out of this one or if he even will because it hasn't wrapped up yet, but the ride has been exceptional. The artwork by Greg Smallwood just, you know, chef's kiss. It is, it is gorgeous, gorgeous stuff that you, you can at least enjoy it on an artistic level, but I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy this story as well. Number three, Reckless. Reckless is the latest project by writer-artist team Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. Now, these guys can do top-tier pulp mysteries in their sleep, but Reckless cuts no corners. Each story is released as a full graphic novel. My favorite one in 2022 was Follow Me Down, which follows the emotionally distant Ethan Reckless falling in love, or at least as close as he is able to. Each story features great action, hateful villains, dazzling femme fatales, and story twists and turns that always surprise me. Great pacing, too, so you're going to feel a wide variety of emotions throughout the read. The reckless stories are set in Southern California in basically uh, in this one, or the last couple, uh, late 70s, 80s, goes into like a little bit of the 90s, so it's sort of a period piece. You know, Ethan Reckless, what an interesting character. You know, used to be an FBI agent, uh, was injured in a bomb explosion. So he has trouble, like, you know, connecting on an emotional level or feeling intense emotions. He's capable of it, but but they're distant for him. Um, and he, uh, 
he sort of just does detective work, but off the books, and only when it interests him. So you end up with some really quirky cases uh, that take him down some interesting paths. The characters around him are always interesting. Just, just wow. Like, really, really interesting stuff. If you've ever wanted to, say, check out, hey, what, would mystery be my bag? I think that Reckless proves it can be for anybody, because it's some really dynamic uh, detective stories with some colorful characters all around him. Fantastic stuff. Just fantastic. Number two, Spy Family. Spy Family has a Cold War setting and a spy infiltrating a foreign land for a plot, but this story is all about character. And what Spy Family offers is that it's genuinely really, really funny. Lloyd Forger is sent to get close to a reclusive opposition leader whose young son attends a private school. To that end, Lloyd adopts an orphan named Anya to attend that school and agrees to a sham marriage with Yor, an employee in the foreign government. But Anya is psychic and Yor is an assassin. Yor and Lloyd each think their family is normal though and precocious Anya loves the adventure. This leads to constant farce as the family tries to conduct their own missions while trying to maintain appearances. And on top of that, they all start to fall for each other. It's charming. The artwork is clean and detailed, but I'll reiterate that it's just really, really funny. I got a taste of just how popular Spy Family was becoming at this past New York Comic Con, when I just saw it represented everywhere. And I think it's exploding for a good reason. It's really, really good. It's funny, it's charming, it's just a really, really fun read. Kind of breezy, but sometimes you need that. And I think that Spy Family is quite, quite good. I'm definitely smitten. Now, before I show you my number one pick out of the top 10 list of the year, I wanted to give a shout out to some runner-ups. Uh, these are some comics that were all in the running for my top 10. I was like, I had to make some really tough decisions, basically. It was, it was really hard not to include these. Uh, the first one I want to mention, The Good Asian. Uh, that's a great crime story, a murder mystery set in 1936 Chinatown with an Asian detective from Hawaii working the case. Um, obviously, real life culture comes into play there because Asians at the time were not detectives, uh, with one exception of, you know, an actual guy uh, from Hawaii, and that's what this takes um, inspiration from. But it's a great, great whodunit, and it features a, a character very much out of his depth. I'm looking at some notes here for some other choices I had. Oh, I would have loved to have included Berserk because Berserk did have a single Tonkabon volume come out in English this year. Um, last work by its creator. Um, so I would have loved to have included that. It, it's, it's, it's just barely not in my top 10. It was still very, very good. It wasn't the best that Berserk has ever been. It wasn't bad at all though. And it was also just a very sort of short chapter or series of chapters, I should say. Uh, it was a tough call not to include this. If you're reading Berserk, I think you'll get a lot out of it. It's just not necessarily the best jumping on point. Um, another one that's really good is Superman Space Age. That's by writer Mark Russell and artist Mike Allred, uh, featuring the DC Universe in sort of that 1950s, 1960s era and, and sort of going in real time and getting affected by the real politics of the day. Um, you know, we sort of saw a little bit of that done once with Spider-Man Life Story by Chip Zdarsky and... Um, uh, Mark Bagley, but this is this is doing that for Superman. It's really really interesting. It's it's fantastic. It looks great. Um, really really interesting look at Superman as well as a bunch of other big DC characters at that time period. Uh, Clementine, I want to call out. Clementine is the first Walking Dead book, or maybe the second now that I think of it written by someone other than Robert Kirkman. You know what, I think he did let Brian K. Vaughn tell a short story set in the Walking Dead universe, and that was originally done digitally, so excuse me. But Clementine is a young adult 
graphic novel. Uh, follows the character from the Telltale Walking Dead games as she makes her way through the zombie apocalypse. Uh, wow, it was it was exceptional. It was really really good story. I don't want to give away the the sort of story too much, but Clementine was definitely something special. Came very close to making my top ten list. Uh, last one I'll mention that that almost made my top ten list, and then I'll close out the whole episode with a few more recommendations. Uh, Eight billion genies. Uh, an image comic that just features the big idea of what if all of a sudden every single person on earth got their own personal genie and was allowed one wish. What would that do to the world? And things get pretty bonkers pretty fast. And each issue sort of features things like the first eight seconds, the first eight minutes, the first eight days, months, years, decades. It, it, it's a cascading effect of like people that hold on to their wishes and, and are able to survive versus like how people survive in this world that gets really bonkers and, and gets to the heart of like what do people want and how do those wants change when they have different perspective. Really good book. All right, it's time to reveal my number one choice for the year. Number one, do a powerbomb. It wasn't that hard to pick my favorite comic of the year. Daniel Warren Johnson can do exciting action like nobody else today. It's not just his dynamic style. It's his decisions on panel placement, sizing, and overall composition. The punches and hits land with impact that make you wince. What elevates Do a Powerbomb is that it features real emotion at its core and some gigantic, huge, surprising story twists that elevate the stakes. The plot is that a necromancer is putting together a wrestling tournament where the winner can bring back a dead loved one. Well, that's plenty of motivation for protagonist Jonas Steele Rose to recover her dead mother, who was the greatest pro wrestler of all time. Daniel Warren Johnson is good at telling stories dealing with loss, and he happens to be a huge fan of pro wrestling. So, you add those together and you get a story that's very original and has some real passion behind it. Not easy to come up with such a list, and I'm not reading a ton of digital comics, so that's not 100% on my radar right now. So if this list is lacking there, that's just a blind spot for me. Uh, but some other things that I think are definitely worth reading, um, probably are gonna make other people's top 10 lists of the year, would be things like uh, action comics, Philip Kennedy Johnson did a great run with Superman in action comics. Um, I heard that The Flash is good, but I didn't read that one. Um, let's see. Uh, Immortal X-Men with Kieran Gillen taken over. That's probably the best X-Men book of this year. Uh, Deadly Class wrapped up. Rick Remender, Wes Craig. Great book, great book. Um, Batman, I really liked with uh, Chip Zdarsky and Jorge Jimenez. I think that that's so far been good action, and I bet it will get into good mystery in 2023. She-Hulk has been a surprisingly charming sort of romance, workplace romance type book. Uh, that's Rainbow Rowell uh, writing that one. Um, some great covers by Jen Bartel as well. I'll mention that. Uh, Noctera is some exceptional post-apocalyptic sort of horror, but really like um, more of like a, a road movie type story. With a, just really good. That's Scott Snyder and, um, oh boy, I'm so bad at names, folks. So when I do this stuff off the top of my head, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting the name uh, of the artist right now. Sorry. Uh, Tony Daniel. Tony Daniel, it came to me. Uh, nice House on the Lake. Wow. That is a really creepy horror book where a bunch of people are invited to live in this house and have all their wants taken care of, but apparently the whole world has been destroyed outside of that world. Um, kind of deals with some of our fears that we're still dealing with a little bit from the pandemic. You know, feeling isolated and being stuck in close situations with certain people, um, just feeling stir crazy. Uh, let's see, public domain. Uh, that's written and drawn by Chip Zdarsky. That's a good one. Um, Crossover by Donny Cates. I'm forgetting the artist there. I'm so sorry, but Crossover is interesting. Once in Future. Once in Future is very good. Uh, Dan Mora. Whew. And speaking of Dan Mora, also good. 
Um, Batman Superman World's Finest. Yeah. Written by Mark Wade, Art by Dan Mora. Boy, do I like his stuff. Um, I've also heard that Monkey Meat, uh, the anthology from Image, is fantastic. I need to read that one. That's really high on my priority list because I've heard really good things about Monkey Meat. My uh, camera uh, stopped because I was talking for so long. But the last one I want to mention is Tokyo Revengers. Great manga. Uh, wrapped up this year. Great premise. Good artwork. Really good artwork. Um, super unique. Definitely recommend that one. Anyway, that was my top 10 list of the year. I'm super curious. What did I miss? Or what did I get wrong? Or what do you super agree with? I would love to hear that kind of stuff in the comments because overall, while I like sharing this and trying to recommend things to people, uh, it's also worth using as an attempt to foster a conversation. We all love comics. Would love to hear what people are really passionate about. Uh, the best way I have to find new comics is hearing recommendations from my listeners. So thank you very much. Uh, by the way, I do have a live show on Mondays at 5 p.m. Pacific every day. That's on my second channel, which is called Pros and Cons. So if you want more comic book content for me, there's always that show. And um, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you real soon. I'm in the middle of editing an episode right now. So I'll get to work on that, get this one out to you. And until then, keep reading comics. Happy New Year. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks. Thank you.